Bom dia a todos e a todas, muito bem-vindos a este webinar do programa Biota, que eh, no dia de hoje vai estar eh, abordando eh, as questões relacionadas ao impacto eh, das pesquisas que o programa desenvolveu na área de educação e de comunicação. Good morning, all. It is a pleasure for us from the Biota program to receive all of you for this uh, webinar. That is the webinar where we are going to focus on the impact uh, the Biota program made in terms of uh, education and communication. This is a very important issue in uh, current days. Uh, how to communicate correctly to the public and how to develop new uh, material and thinking about uh, education, biodiversity, conservation education, and uh, subjects related to the environment. It's a pleasure for me to receive Professor Luiz Eugenio Melo, who is the scientific director of FAPESPI, and will give us some words of welcoming, Professor Luiz Mello. So uh, apologies for the delay. My connection just uh, 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 fell down. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good night uh, to you all. It's a pleasure uh, being here. And uh, I would like to thank uh, professors uh, Susan Clayton, Alexand Alessandra Bezerra, and um, uh, Susana Ursi uh, for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, this topic is uh, of uh, crucial importance for everyone doing science because at the end uh, we need and we wish to influence how society uh, uh, accepts uh, the findings uh, uh, developed out of uh, uh, good and well-conducted uh, research. Uh, in the beginning of this uh, uh, section uh, we were discussing how uh, scientists are uh, riddled uh, with doubts and uh, have no clear certainty of uh, a number of things. And how we express ourselves is uh, of crit critical importance uh, for how the society uh, perceives uh, what uh, we uh, uh, at last uh, find, uh, what are the uh, major conclusions and how we can uh, influence uh, not only uh, the way we live, but uh, the way life uh, exists on our planet. So uh, with that, I would like uh, to once again, uh, thank you all for being here. Congratulate uh, Professor Carlos Jolie and uh, all of the colleagues from the Biota program for this uh, excellent series of uh, webinars. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Luiz Eugenio. And now uh, I'll give the floor to uh, Susana Ursi. She's from the Bioscience Institute at University of Sao Paulo and will start the presentation on uh, the impact uh, made by the Pro Biota program on education and communication. Susana, the floor is with you. Thank you, Professor Julie. Uh, it's a big pleasure 
to be here with all of you. And I'm really happy because some years ago we did a meeting about education and communication, and we have only at that time only three projects to talk about, and now we have maybe 10, 10, 10, 10 times more, and then it's so good. I will share my presentation with you. Just a moment. Well, then we will speak a little bit about the impacts um, of biota FAPESP in the last decades. Uh, we choose some topics to talk about. There are the advantages in education and communication knowledge, uh, some historical notes on biota. Uh, we will talk also about the funded projects uh, and about uh, uh, the institutional communication. And to finalize our presentation, we will talk about uh, some future per perspectives. Uh, and I will start to speak with you. We shared these presentations, and we shared the responsibility with research project co coordinators uh, through a questionnaire. And then we asked about the advantages in the area. And um, here I summarized some points that we think it's important. And the participatory research is a great point because things are changing. And um, each time more, we have this kind of uh, research. Uh, the co-authorship become to be very important in the last years. And we notice that uh, the local population is so essential for the success of um, conservation projects. Then it's a very important point in, about um, education and communication knowledge in the last years. Also, diversity is a very important um, term, a very important concept. We have diversity in references, approaches, methodologies. Um, for example, the focus on differences, cultures, and diversity of people is now very strong in the area. Um, some points about methodology. We have qualitative approaches, quantitative approaches, mixed ones, um, case studies now, and also we use much more the softwares in education area. Uh, some researchers, they point out that in Brazil, we use it to be very focused on quantitative qualitative research, but nowadays we have also these quantitative approaches, which is good to bring new questions of research, maybe a bigger scale and some like that. Well, the diversity is important in all areas of society and also in educational and communication research. Uh, the valorization and diversification in museology area is another important point. And to talk more specifically about the communication, this cultural perspective and uh, um, a strong critique of deficit models become important aspects. Uh, again, the participatory models and uh, different approaches to study many subjects, for example, images, if they are representations of reality, some years ago, now we can think uh, about um, the reality itself, with kind of difference. We summarize it a little bit more in some words, important words, what uh, the coordinators said about um, the area. 
Uh, and then we bring, we highlight diversity, participation, new methodologies and new perspectives, collaboration and improvement, which is a very positive scenario. Talking more specifically about uh, the evidences of researches from biota, we can say that nowadays we are much more able to understand the concepts, especially about young people um, in terms of biodiversity in different contexts. Um, also, we can understand better which are the factors involved in the acceptance of evolutionary. And also, it becomes to be very clean the difference of perception between plants and animals, which have also consequences to teaching about the biodiversity. Uh, especially about marine and coastal environments. We noticed in the last years, we have many studies about this, that there is very difficult to establish this relationship between daily life and these environments. Uh, also, we are able to understand better how the topic of biodiversity is addressed in curriculum and also in teaching materials. For example, in Brazilian national curriculum, we can notice that we have very few about um, biodiversity and uh, we also don't have the diversity that we expected, for example, um, among biomes or regions. Uh, we have a very limited focus on evolutionary questions. And unfortunately, we have a lot of memorization yet. And this, the teaching strategies sometimes are really focused on describe the characteristics of groups and some like that with limited contextualization, which can be, and it is so important to approach biodiversity. But a good point is that we can notice an uh, increasing valorization and implementation of some more dynamic and participatory strategies. For example, teaching to research, this approach of science, technology, and environment, laboratory, and fields, and field activities. Then uh, it's a good point of view, a kind of evolution. And now that we have this little introduction about um, the area of education and communication, we denied, we'd like to point out some notes on Biota for Pest program. Uh, the program started in 1999. And if we go to the official site, we are not able to find a specific aim about education. But maybe we can include here in the last point, I include I am about education. Why? Because if we go to the first number and the first in volume of a Biota Neotropic, Neotropica, we can find some observations, some comments about education. For, for example, uh, Stanley, he asked, what can and should we do to educate public and to begin to talk about some actions. And then the author gave some suggestions. Uh, Chapman, for example, he said uh, that the public interest and involve involvement in conservation of biodiversity needed to be increased. How we can do this? For example, in visitor centers, um, doing local field guides, uh, in is, is school programs, maybe a television series, then we can notice that it, since the beginning, 
there is this concern about education and communication at Biota. In uh, 2009, we have the first meeting to celebrate uh, 10 years of Biota program. And then we have a very different context at that time. Here we have some pictures of that year. Um, in political terms, we have different governments, uh, but some things are so similar. At that time, we are uh, facing a pandemic time also with swimming flu, swim flu, and also a big economic crisis like now. And at that meeting, we don't have a special space to talk about education and communication. But uh, people said a lot that it is needed. It was needed at that time. And one year later, we have a sectorial meeting. And at that time, we have 18 researchers uh, that are concerned about education and they talk about possibilities to act, act uh, a special call for projects in education, material production, and here I put some of the conclusions at that time. And now I'm very happy because at that meeting, I was there, Erika Chu, and then we are talking about mainly three projects. And now we have a third project to talk about, which is very good. It's an increase in the area. We still have a lot to do, but for sure we are in a bad, better way than at that time. And now, after these notes, we will give um, a panoramic view of what is happening now. And during the two the last two decade, decades. And now we have uh, uh, 16 projects that are researches in biodiversity, but that have these productions about materials to schools, to museums, um, to communication. Two projects that are kind of hybrid, they are about biodiversity, but also we can find some educational research and 11 projects that are really researches in education, which we talk, we think it's very, very good to the area. Here we did a graphic to show you uh, how these activities are distributing uh, during the years. In Orange, we have the action and projects. There are projects that do this, and in blue we have, which is research in education. Uh, I will, I'd like to show you some of these products that are made in these research about biodiversity projects. And then we have books, we have uh, very modern things like uh, online interactions, uh, scientific scientship. Here we have some beautiful examples of field guide books, manuals. And also we have uh, uh, projects of training teachers or in schools. Now we would like to talk a little bit about uh, the the projects that are focused on research in education. And to do this, I'd like to finish my presentation and, oops, here, and Professor uh, Alessandra will talk with you. Please, Alessandra, now is with you. Thank you, Susana. I will share my screen. Just a minute, please. Okay. 
So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, to start, I'd like to thank Professor Luiz Eugenio and Professor Jolie for the invitation to participate in this, this evening, in this meeting. To Professor Susan Clayton for joining us today. All the staff of APESP for the excellent organization. And of course, for uh, to Susana and Erica for the mutual support in this endeavor. So I'm charged to, of presenting in 10 minutes the research projects in education and related areas that were funded by the BIOTA program between 1999 and 2018. Uh, we decided to display a timeline that helps to understand the transformation on the nature of those projects. Uh, as so shown by Professor Susana, we have found it from the beginning of the BIOTA program, projects that were focused on biodiversity in research, but also produced educational and communication materials. From, from 2002 to 2005, uh, what we call hybrid projects were approved. Um, these projects develop re research both in biodiversity and in education. Uh, just in 2006, we saw the first project that was completely focused on education research, which started a series of six other projects of the same typology. In 2011, uh, a, project, a project which studied the interaction between museology and biodiversity was approved. I thought there have been previous uh, by other projects aiming museum collections. This was the, the first one with a, with a clear social approach. In 2013, a project in the area of psychology was approved. And in 2015, there was an expansion of related areas, including conservation management and particip participatory research. Uh, the Biota Education Call is clearly uh, important to our area, having approved four projects in 2016. I would now like to focus on the 13 projects with research in education or related areas. Among them, there are 11 regular grants, one young researcher, and one thematic project. Four public universities were contemplated, USP, Unicamp, UNIFESP, and UNESP. Uh, here we summarized uh, the main research questions, theoretical methodological references, uh, subjects and institutions that were involved in, in the project, and also the main products and contributions from each project. Among these 13 projects, we find research questions established at micro, meso, and macro levels of analysis with different layers of complexities. I won't go into details about it this due to the short time, time we have here. Uh, one of the important discussions raised among the projects is related to, to, to curriculum studies. Some projects aim to investigate school knowledge and this organization, seeking links between science and culture. Another research question is to understand the mechanisms for optimizing the teaching in, uh, of biodiversity and evolution. Still in the school sphere, there are projects that seek innovation in, in biodiversity education, developing new instruction strategies and new assessment and evaluation tools. A fourth research question in this, in this 13 project um, involves understanding the concepts, beliefs, and values related to biodiversity expressed by students and general public, promoting a base for development of better educational and communication tools. Other projects seek to investigate levels of in nature of engagement, whether individual or collective, addressing issues such as participation, uh, ethnobiology, and human-animal relations. Different institutions are studied, both in relation to their discourse about biodiversity and evolution, 
and also the potential and obstacles of different institutional arrangements for conservation management. Another uh, aspect of our work is to assess important references in the area. For example, we found work related to theoretical methodological framework done by Deleuze related to philosophy and aesthetics, and also Lucie Sauvet, uh, who is related to environment education. We also assessed theoretical perspectives from the educational field, such as cultural, historical activity theory, and design-based research. Very close to science education are scientific literacy, argumentation, and inquiry-based teaching, all considering science, technology, society, and environment. Among the works in correlated areas, the most cited references are the ones in the area of ethnoprometological approach, resilience and adaptive capacity, participatory management, and ecosystem stewardship. The subjects in those studies are students, communities, teachers, researchers, museum staff, policymakers, and ethnic groups. Patterns, partnerships have been established with schools, museums, including zoos and aquariums, NGOs, social movements, and government agencies in Brazil, but also in other countries such as Argentina, Mozambique, and Russia. When we ask the, the coordinators, coordinators what the main products of their projects would be, articles, document, documentaries, courses, and many others were cited. We list some of them here, trying to cover all the 13, 13 projects. We, br uh, we bring as example the article by Professor Nelio Bizu, uh, published inside Advances, that shows us differences in, in studied interest for biodiversity uh, depending on, the, on where they live. Other examples are articles written by Professor Ian Rodriguez, uh, published in co-authorship with the Quilombolas participating in the project. Another worth mentioned product products are new didactic proposals for schools. The Educational Technology Lab from Unicamp, coordinated by Professor Eduardo Kallenbeck, developed low-cost equipment to teach science, besides videos suggesting new use possibilities of these equipment. Uh, in the project coordinated by Noemi Spagnoletti, a community initiative involved rural schools to promote the conservation of primates. Teachers and also educators from informal learning settings participate in different professional development actions. Professor Marcelo Motocani, for example, promoted the participation of local teachers in research group meetings when they produced and also evaluated uh, inquiry-based teaching learning sequences. Uh, professional development is also the goal of projects such as the one led by Professor, Professor Flavio Berchez, who designed two courses and has already reached more than 1,100 educators and 25,000 students. In my project, we prepared and delivered courses to educators in schools in aquariums. A face-to-face -face version at the same course was, was offered to educators from different, different seats in the state of Sao Paulo, and will soon be available online. Uh, I'd like to highlight the books and the books that have been published. Uh, we bring the example of the book written by Cristiana Seixas that, that was used in undergrad courses at New Camp and USP. Uh, Professor Osmar Cafasan produced uh, a manual on botany and ecology, which have been used by different publics, including schools. Professor Susanna Ursi uh, wrote many books on biodiversity teaching, which have more than 20,000 downloads each one. Uh, we also want to mention the exhibition Scattered Fragments by Professor Antonio Carlos Amorim 
and Biodiversity Knowing to Preserve by Maria Isabel Landin. So uh, we see, therefore, that the process in the products of the projects funded by Biota Education were important for different fields and follow the research advances, advances shown by Professor Susana earlier. Here we summarize some of their main contributions. Part of the coordinators mentioned that the Biota program was essential to implement a new line of research in their institution, with the strengthening of the graduate program and the training of undergrad and grad students. Despite the low number of projects in education in rich areas, there was an evident amount of knowledge produced by the projects. There are also contributions to research methodology with the development of method, methods and protocols. In the social political context, we hi highlight the progress in understanding perceptions, beliefs, and behaviors related to biodiversity in the professional develop development of teachers and educators. We, we emphasize that some of uh, the projects have expanded their reach, promoting engagement and social participation and also contri contributing to public policies. However, more projects in the area are necessary, which, which requires, requires more financial aid and support. Well, I hope uh, we could give you uh, an overview of the approved projects in bio, in bio education. Uh, thank you for all listening, and now I will pass to Professor Erika Speglis. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you, Susana. Um, I'm here to talk uh, about the institutional channels for um, communication in, in the OTA program. Uh, our way, our objective in this, with these channels is to spread the information about the projects and the, the knowledge that uh, uh, researchers are creating uh, in their different uh, projects. So we have a homepage, a social media, YouTube, a newsletter that goes to the email with all these different channels, we think that we can reach different audiences. So in Facebook, we reach more uh, Brazilian audience with uh, 30 years old or more. Our Twitter have a more an international uh, public. Our, uh, our idea for Instagram is for upcoming into uh, the next year to target a more young audience, uh, which we see is important after uh, this, this series of, of projects and results that, that we, we had in the OTA. And with this, we think we can um, spread the, the ideas and uh, the results. Uh, we, of course, have the full support of FAPESP to FAPESP news agents, the Pesquisa FAPESP magazine, and this, the event team in FAPESP that makes all these webinars possible, for example. And uh, some new partnerships that are growing, that started this year and are growing. Uh, uh, like the body news agents, agents that uh, publish press releases about upcoming and publish articles. We had some, uh, some of these articles this year published by them and they could reach uh, another uh, uh, medias. Uh, the next uh, platform on public policies, the next is an uh, online uh, newspaper. And they have this special um, special platform for science. And nowadays we have four new features a month written by the Piotr Fapesp researchers with the collaboration with the next uh, uh, team, like opinions on everything that is going on, like fires on the on the forests or what they do 
water in the country, what about uh, the COVID and uh, our forests, interviews, and, and other types of classes. And the, the newest partnership nowadays is with Cielo Blogs, that's about the Biota Neotropic Journal. So, uh, and we have um, some special events in the last 20 years, like exhibitions, video series, conferences, and these webinars. This is uh, all for an institu institutional side, uh, side, and we think that it will grow and get better with um, close relationship with the researchers that are on educational and communication area. So um, we just to finish our presentation, like Susanna and Alessandra told, we asked the Biota researchers about the last 20 years and also about the future. So they pointed out some gaps and some important uh, research trends that could be interesting to fulfill in the next 20 years. So uh, the current gaps, uh, it's kind of more interaction among projects, among educational projects and among uh, educational and biodiversity projects. Like uh, Susanna said in the beginning, maybe an insertion on Biota Neotropica Journal would be interesting. Another current gap is about environmental education, education trying to differentiate it in an epistemological way from the education for biodiversity. We didn't have this discussion or project in this area to, to, to make it uh, real. Uh, we don't have until now any, any research project on science communication. It's, this is a, a, a huge gap. And the creation of an agenda, an participatory agenda for education and communication in, in the program. For research trends for the future, it, it's a lot of interesting ideas and very a uh, lot of diversity and we can point out the concept of diversity and biodiversity to inspire education um, it, um deeper thoughts on tra teacher training uh, both on scholar or no schooler environments uh, researches between the relation, uh, research about the relations between human and non-human for sustainab sustainability, aesthetics, images, and cultures of biodiversity, and some uh, different concepts that we can uh, take to 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 dialogue with the idea of biodiversity, like the epistemologies of the South, co-production of knowledge, collaborative science, and uh, participatory ways of make science, uh, and some specific or more specific lines of, of research, like the connections with the national curriculum, uh, the, the relations between the public awareness on biodiversity and the awareness on evolution, the impact of collections, uh, conserva converse, conservation management on protected um, protect areas. So I would like to, to thank you all and to call Professor Julie for the next moment on our, our webinar. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Susanna uh, and Alessandra, for the overview uh, of uh, what has been produced and the impact that the program, the Biota program, had on education. And thank you, Erica, for showing what is the institutional arrangements for communication on biodiversity. And uh, I thank you three also for this uh, look into the future. 
uh, the ideas that were presented by researchers already uh, with project within uh, the Biota program and what we can do in the next phase of the program. Uh, for me now, it's a great pleasure uh, to invite uh, Professor Susan Clayton. Uh, Susan is the Psychology Department Chair at the College of Worcester, Ohio, US. Uh, she's been working with uh, psychology of uh, environmental conservation. She also has been working with uh, environmental uh, psychology of environmental justice. And it's a pleasure for us to have her here. And she will talk about psychological principles to promote environmental conservation. Susan, the floor is with you. Thank you. Good morning, bon dia. I... Okay. So I'm, I'm, thank you for inviting me to be part of this meeting. Um, what I want to do is give an overview of some of the ways in which I think psychology can be used to promote environmental conservation. And I like to start by reminding us um, of, of something very basic and very important, which is that people like nature and they like animals in particular. Um, and I have you know, a variety of, of pictures. I, I like these pictures in particular because if you look at the faces of the people, they have these enormous smiles. This is a, a naked mole rat. You can't see it very well. And here you have um, definitely the tourists smiling as they see the elephant, but even the, the uh, elephant handler, the man who works at the, um, at the site is also smiling. There's just, it's something irresistible about the animals. But liking is apparently a not enough for us to protect nature. Um, despite people's affection for nature, we are losing species and natural ecosystems um, something that I know that you're all also very aware of. So we need to have interventions to promote conservation. Um, and we need to recognize the role of human behavior, uh, not just human attitudes in favor of animals, but um, human behaviors that uh, degrade habitat and put species at risk. And some of the different types of behaviors that are relevant are individual behavioral choices. Um, what a single person decides to do, maybe to, to buy or to plant, or whether they choose to uh, drive a private car or, or take public transportation. But the individual's behavior does not just stop with them because they also, each individual contributes to a more generalized norm, what's considered typical behavior. And so that has the power to influence um, society at a much broader level. And then individuals also can affect institutional processes by their support or lack of support for various governmental or even business policies and practices. So psychology uh, likes to consider itself the science of human behavior. And uh, we have a lot of understanding of the kinds of things that affect behavior. Um, and I wanna start by saying that even though we, we often jump to um, thinking about people's motivations and their attitudes, um, the physical environment and the legal environment also affect behavior clearly. Um, this is a, a picture of a light switch with a reminder sticker uh, that just tells people to please turn off the lights. Um, and most people don't mind turning off the lights. They don't object to turning off the lights when they leave a room, but they might need a reminder. So a, uh, constructing the environment to remind them of that um, uh, can, can encourage that kind of behavior. Clearly legal, uh, legal prohibitions and constraints um, can also affect the kinds of behaviors people will engage in. And many times it can actually be easier to change the environment 
than to change the person's mind. So thinking about how the environment um, and the, uh, the, the context can be changed to encourage certain types of behavior and make other types of behavior um, more difficult. So for example, um, plastic shopping bags are a big problem uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of parts of the world. And um, uh, one thing that's been done in some areas is to prohibit bags, to prohibit plastic bags and tell people they need to bring their own bag. Um, so that obviously makes it more difficult for people to use those plastic bags. But it's also the case that people don't like to feel that their behavior is being controlled by others. So it's best to, um, if possible, to minimize explicit control of behavior and instead um, shape and guide behavior through what is often called a behavioral nudge. So a behavioral nudge essentially makes some behaviors more likely, some behaviors less likely without actually prohibiting behavior. Um, so it could be, so the, the more sustainable behavior becomes the, the default option, the expected option. And if people want to do something different, they have to ask for it. So in the US, many stores will automatically give people plastic bags. But if instead you ask people, would you like a bag? Um, that actually cuts way down on the number of people who get bags. Um, again, it doesn't, uh, without without prohibiting their behavior. They're certainly, they can have a bag if they want it, but just make, asking them um, if they want it as opposed to just automatically supplying it. Um, if you want to reduce meat eating, for example, instead of prohibiting uh, meat, you can offer more vegetarian meal options and even something as simple as putting them first on the menu. Um, whereas in many restaurants, you have the vegetarian options relegated to the bottom of the list where people are, are um, they don't see them right away. So that can also have an impact on behavior. There are other things, of course, besides the physical and legal context that determine behavior. Uh, many people act or assume that people engage in a cost benefit analysis, um, a rational analysis of the behavior that makes sense. And here's a sign, this is from a botanical garden in China, it says, no forest, no water, no water, no farmland, no farmland, no food, no food, we cannot live. You know, so clearly from a rational point of view, that means we need to protect the forest. But people are not always rational. And I, I, I suspect you all know that already. Um, some of the ways in which people are not rational is in the way they process information. So people show a preference for um, the status quo, the existing state of affairs. They're more likely, um, it's hard to shift people out of what they're currently doing. Um, that means that if people are forced to change their behavior for another reason, that can actually be a very good time to try to change their behavior, uh, which is I think why a lot of people are focusing on the moment of the current pandemic as an opportunity to change behavior in a more sustainable way. People show loss aversion. They worry about what they might lose by doing something differently. And that has more powerful influence than, than thinking about what they might gain. So you might try to tell them that by doing something differently, they can um, protect the rainforest um, and that's a, a potential gain, but they're, they're probably more influenced by their thoughts of what they might lose in terms of their own comfort or in terms of their own economic uh, resources. And people tend to have a certain starting point, an anchor, um, and then adjust from that starting point. So even if, if they have a starting point that is much too small, they will adjust upward, but they might not adjust upward as much as they should. If they have a starting point that is much too big, they'll adjust downward, but perhaps not as much as they should. So it's very important to pay attention to that initial anchor. And that can apply to all kinds of things from uh, there might be a size limit on fish that could be harvested or um, uh, some other kind of uh, uh, 
wildlife or even, even vegetable. Um, there could be an anchor, uh, an estimated cost for something, and they will adjust that. So you need to think about um, where are they coming up with that initial anchor from. I think very importantly, people also have emotional biases, and I'm sure we've all we've all seen a lot of this, especially when it comes to how people respond to the coronavirus, for example. Um, so to protect their own feelings of uh, of happiness and security, for example, they may deny that there's a problem at all. Um, and you can't convince people to address a problem if they're denying that the problem exists. Um, this is a big problem for climate change. It can be a problem for um, uh, biodiverse, threats to biodiversity as well. People just don't want to believe that it's a problem. A somewhat more subtle example of that is when we people want to defend the current system. So if they're led to believe that the problem, say loss of biodiversity, is the result of their lifestyle or their political system, they might be motivated to justify that lifestyle or justify that system and very reluctant to admit that there are any flaws in it. And then often a particular social group might become associated with a position. And so people are motivated to defend that group. And this is, um, from a US conflict uh, says, save loggers, shoot an owl. And it's based on a conflict that was very salient uh, 10 or 15 years ago in the Pacific Northwest, where um, a particular owl species, uh, the spotted owl was um, being threatened by logging, by the um, harvesting of wood from local forests. And this was presented as if the owl was, was um, protecting the owl would cost the employment of the loggers. And of course it was not that simple at all, but the loggers were convinced that they were the enemies of the owls. So they had to defend their own group. Um, and if nobody, I picked this cap because it's, it's stupid to shoot an owl, um, but that was how the issue became defined that they were enemies of the owls. So we do need to provide information and clearly the previous um, presentations um, emphasize the importance of education and people need to know what the problems are and they need to know how to deal with them. But information has to be new. Uh, people, if they think they know it already, they won't pay attention. Um, it's important for the, for the information to be practical if we want it to, to change behavior. So just telling people there's a problem, um, there's a threat to biodiversity is unlikely to get them to change their behavior. You have to explain why information that's relevant to their behavior. They have to pay attention to the information. So it has to be interesting or vivid, um, emotionally compelling. They need to understand it, of course. And a lot of times um, I, I think scientists have been criticized for giving information that's not clearly understandable. And they need to remember that information. Um, it needs to be presented to them in a way that they can make it meaningful to themselves. And so telling people a story is often more interesting and easier to remember than giving them a list of facts. But information alone is not enough. We need to think about other determinants of behavior. Um, and in particular, social influences are very important. Um, people like to be liked by others. So they want to signal that they are engaging in desirable behaviors. And those desirable behaviors may be the more sustainable ones. Um, so there is some research showing that people, if people perceive sustainability as socially desirable, they will be more likely to engage in those behaviors. Um, a social influence can include norms, so what people see as typical behavior, that's a descriptive norm, but also a prescriptive norm. What do people see as desirable behavior? And this was um, uh, also from China, a, an ad campaign to, to discourage people from eating shark fin soup um, by high, harnessing the, the power of this very popular figure, Yao Ming, a basketball player. Um, he says, you know, Yao, does not eat shark fin soup. You should also refuse to, eat, refuse to eat shark fin soup. So that's not a descriptive norm, but it's a prescriptive norm. It says it would be desirable to protect the sharks. 
and important people think it's desirable. Your social identity can be also tied to your behavior and social identities essentially are ways, are, are feelings of bonds to other people. Um, they may be based on a particular place. And so my state, Ohio, is called sometimes the Buckeye State because of a, a, a tree, the Buckeye tree. And I got this um, fundraising message from an environmental organization that says, what would the Buckeye State be like without the Buckeye? Um, global warming could make the Buckeye rare. So they are, they are appealing to my place-based identity, my desire to protect the tree, not because it's a, an important tree, but because it's my tree in my state. There's a picture of the, the Buckeye leaves. Or it can be a particular group that comes together to engage in a conservation behavior. And a program that's been um, utilized in the US, I don't know if it's used anywhere else, is call it Adopt a Highway. And a particular group will take responsibility for cleaning up a particular section of highway. And so they, and then they get to put their name on the sign by the side of the highway. So it's a way of um, reflecting positively on their group by taking care of that place. But in addition to social uh, influences, individual values, attitudes, and interest also have an impact. So we need to think about those individual preferences and how we get to be people to be interested in conservation, interested in, in protecting species, interested in nature, because most people do not pay a lot of attention. They don't even notice um, the loss of habitat or the loss of species. It feels like a very distant um, threat to them because they have more immediate concerns. So we need to find a way for people to feel a sense of connection to the biodiversity crisis. And one of the ways to do that, it can be to encourage anthropomorphism where people um, ascribe human characteristics to non-human elements of nature. And I think a lot of us have seen that done with animals, but it can also be done with regard to, to plants. Here's an example from an experiment um, where people got the message to save trees with a picture of a tree, or they got the message to save me and the tree now has a face. And people actually gave more money to the same cause when they saw the, sa when they saw the tree being represented as if it had a personality. And I've seen this, um, not just in experimental settings, but in actual settings. Here's one from uh, South Africa, um, where a tree speaks to the passersby and says, um, essentially, don't harm me. I am the tree and here are all the ways in which um, you make use of me. But the tree is speaking for itself. Here's a sign from Australia where the grass is speaking for itself. Please don't tread on me. Um, so this really encourages ascribing human personality to the plants. And people are prepared to make this kind of connection. Um, you may have seen uh, many zoos or environmental organizations promote symbolic species adoptions where you can, you don't really adopt an animal, of course, but you'd give some money and you'll get some information about that animal. And now it feels like yours. So you've made a personal connection to it. That feeling of connection has been shown to increase people's um, donations to environmental groups. So when I talk about connection, what I'm really talking about is a perception of shared identity, um, that we have something in common. I have something in common with a panda, as in this drawing by school children. Um, I have something, there's something personally relevant. Nature is part of my family. And I call that an environmental identity. An environmental identity, um, which I have a scale to measure, has been shown to make environmental topics feel more personal and to therefore promote environmental concern and, and pro-environmental behavior. And that feeling of environmental identity or similarity predicts empathy or care for other species, which in turn predicts helping. And here's a quote from a member of the Sierra Club that says, 
my motivations for protecting the wild earth are selfish, showing that it's when you form that connection, you're not, you're not giving essentially on behalf of someone else. You're giving on behalf of something that is personal to you. An environmental identity comes from opportunities to experience nature. Um, ideally, that happens for children um, when they're still really forming their self-concept and in the company of important others. So there's a social significance to the experience as well, but it can still happen even as adults. So when we think about promoting more conservation behavior, uh, I think there are a number of tasks, tasks to be aware of. Um, it is important to provide information, to provide those educational experiences. Um, but beyond that, we need to convince people that there is social support for conservation and for engagement with the natural world. And even beyond that, to facilitate ways for people to feel that personal connection with the natural environment. So when we think about how to encourage conservation behavior, um, one, of the, uh, one of the issues is, well, what kind of behaviors do we want to promote? Is it a fairly short-term tool? Is there just a single behavior we want people to do? Um, take your trash and put it in the recycling bin, maybe. Um, then we need to focus on the most significant behaviors because people behave in a lot of ways that have conservation relevance and we can't address all of them at once. We need to think about the ones that are most important. We also need to think about the behaviors that are easiest to change. And I'll say more about that in just a second. Um, which ones are most, um, can we most easily affect? Uh, so which ones, is there an intervention that we can identify that is, um, uh, feasible. So when thinking about the most significant behaviors, and, and I say this in part because a lot of psychological research tended to focus on easy, on behaviors that were easy to measure, but because they're easy to measure doesn't necessarily mean they have the biggest environmental impact. Um, so here is a range of different kinds of behaviors that can be studied. Um, curtailment behavior, which means getting people to use less of something choosing a particular technology, which might mean um, buying a more efficient car or a more efficient refrigerator, or even at a, at a lower price point, um, a more efficient light bulb. Behavioral choice, which is choosing to do something in a different way. And that could include um, maybe something like drying clothes on a, on a clothesline in the sun, as opposed to in a clothes dryer or eating more vegetable-based uh, meals rather than uh, meat-based meals. But also public engagement is a very important behavior. People's willingness to um, advocate publicly for a particular policy. So um, some of those are clearly going to, or within each category, some of them are going to have a greater impact on uh, conservation than others. We also need to think about behaviors that are easy to change. So you could have a big impact by telling people to have fewer children. Fewer children, there's gonna be fewer infringement on habitat. People are gonna be buying fewer uh, things, um, but it's very hard to convince people to, to have fewer children. That, behavioral, that behavior is not what we call very plastic. Um, so among the behaviors that have influence, think of the ones that maybe people are more willing to change. And then what are the most influential forces for that behavior? So I talked about structural factors, which can be the most important forces for some things. Um, the social context may be more important for other behaviors. And the way in which the message is framed, um, maybe highlighting people's personal connection to nature may be the most important thing for some behaviors. And then having identified an important behavior um, and, a, and a, a behavior that's amenable to change, design an intervention or an educational message. Think about the best time to implement that intervention. Ideally pilot test it before rolling it out in a, in a 
broad level and definitely include an assessment afterwards to see if it worked, which unfortunately um, often public um, uh, organizations that are trying to do the right thing do not include this, this post-intervention assessment. So they've tried something, but we really have no very good idea as to whether it worked or not. It's also important, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but to preserve people's feelings of personal efficacy. Um, so that their own feeling that they can make a difference because nobody is going to bother to engage in a behavior if they think it's worthless. And I think we, um, we face this a lot with environmental issues where people feel like the issue is too big, they can't make a difference. So we need to remind people that they can um, or encourage them to feel that they can. And it's also very important to support local values. So um, environmental conservation affects everybody, but it doesn't affect everybody the same way. And people may have very different immediate concerns. People may be concerned with protecting their family, with feeding their family, um, with uh, issues of, um, of, of racism um, uh, that might be operating in their communities. So to come in and as an outsider and say, I know the thing you should be doing to promote conservation um, is not going to be a very effective way to operate. And it's also not a very just way to operate. So um, work with local communities to support their values. But in the long term, as we think about um, creating a long term con context for environmental conservation, I really think we need to focus on that idea of creating connections between people and nature, providing opportunities for people to establish those feelings of connection. And um, I'll close with that. Uh, and I think we have time for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very inspiring uh, talk, uh, Susan. And uh, uh, it's it's really uh, a great pleasure to have you participating in this uh, webinar with us. I'm sure this your talk will uh, serve as uh, feed the discussion uh, that we are going to have with the group of researchers uh, just afterwards. Uh, we finish this public part of the uh, the discussion. Uh, but now we have uh, time for. Uh, some uh, questions, and uh, uh, I think that uh, Professor Alessandra has a question for Susan. Uh, I think, Su Susan, I will make a question first, Julie. Oh, Susanna, hey. okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you, Ale. <laughs> Susan, uh, thanks a lot for the great speech. Uh, very nice. Um, I'd like to ask it about uh, a concept that we are listening a lot about, that is plant blindness. And then I'd like to know if you also notice this difference in engagement about plants and animals. And if you think that we maybe need a special strategies to talk about plants to engage people more with this, and also about the relation about this kind of a better understand of plants and about the climate change, because we feel that they are so related. Would you help with these questions? <laughs> yes, thank you, Susanna, for that for that wonderful question. I agree uh, very much. Um, I think it, it partly comes down to attention. That um, there's a lot of things people don't pay attention to, and they are more likely to pay attention to animals than to plants. Um, I think that's um, instinctive. You know, we we pay attention to things that move more and we pay attention to things that we find it easier to anthropomorphize. So um, people project human characteristics on animals very easily. But I do think that can be 
um, counteracted by, well, as I, I showed you, there are examples in which you can get people even to anthropomorphize plants and, and giving people more interesting information about plants, I think will encourage that kind of attention. So um, it's, uh, I think, a, a virtuous cycle that if, if you teach people a little bit about plants, then they start to pay attention, they feel more connected, they want to learn more. And um, I've, I have not worked with a botanical uh, garden. I, I would like to, it's, it's something I feel that I should do. Mostly I've worked with zoos, but I know that botanical gardens um, are places where people can learn a lot of that interesting information and people are fascinated by, for example, carnivorous plants. So that's a, a start um, or plants you know, that have some distinctive characteristics. So um, just to wrap up, I do think that you're right that plants don't get as much attention, but I think um, they can be encouraged to do, to, people can be encouraged to pay more attention. And I should mention one more thing, which is self-interest. So when people are told why they should care about plants, um, that can also help them to pay attention. And so the importance of plants to maintaining a healthy atmosphere, for example. Thanks a lot, Susan. And then I can invite you to work together with us in Brazil <laughs> about the botanic stuff. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, Alessandra, please. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Uh, hi, Susan. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, I was thinking your um, other research line in social justice, and I would like to know uh, what re relationships do you establish between social justice and psychology, uh, conservation, conservation psychology? Uh, in, a, in, a, in your opinion, in a country like Brazil, uh, where social justice that justice is fragile. What will be the challenges for conservation psychology? Oh, that is such a, a big question. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I try to pay attention to is the differential impacts of environmental threats on different groups. So climate change, obviously, uh, we have very clear evidence that um, some people are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Um, by virtue of uh, economic status, but also perhaps uh, minority status um, and so on. Um, with regard to uh, environmental conservation uh, and, and uh, protection of species, I haven't thought about it as much, but to the extent that people are more, people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged are almost always going to be more threatened by these environmental changes because, um, you know, they may be more reliant on um, ecosystem services or they have fewer personal resources to compensate for those environmental changes. Um, one of the things I have you know, tried to pay attention to is gender in particular um, and the way in which women are often uh, placed at greater risk um, of threats from environmental changes, such as, um, you know, women are often responsible for collecting the food or collecting the water or growing the food in many less developed countries around the world. So that when um, there are species loss or there's, uh, you know, degradation of habitat, um, it may be the woman who's, whose lives are affected more. And when there's, um, you know, when there's not enough food available, girls often receive a lower proportion of the food than the, than the boys do in a family. So um, I think being aware of those different impacts of environmental changes is extremely important. And then um, when trying to promote a particular um, conservation policy, to be sure to consider the perspectives and hopefully the voices of people who are in different positions with regard to society. Um, and actually, I should also mention indigenous peoples are often 
another group that is clearly more profoundly affected by environmental changes and have traditionally not been given a very strong voice in any decisions about how to use environmental resources. I hope that began to answer your question. <laughs> thank you. Oh, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I have a question from uh, Dr. Elena Perez. She uh, comes from the uh, area of history. And uh, her question is, I would like to do a comment to hear what you think about it. Maybe the inclusion of environmental and cultural history project could help improve the dialogue between different types of knowledge. I consider this because the knowledge of historical context is important to connect people with their communities and also with the natural world and with a long time that human beings are transforming and being transformed by nature. Yes, I think that's an excellent point. Um, one of the ways in which people can be encouraged to feel that personal connection to nature is through um, history and cultural history in particular. Um, and you, I, I see that over and over again, even in people who don't necessarily think of themselves as environmentalists, but they talk about their family's um, tradition with a particular crop or with a particular um, uh, practice like fishing or hunting or with a particular um, piece of land, uh, their, their personal family history or their, um, their sort of social history, their, their traditions associated with that, um, yeah, with that species uh, or with that way of interacting with the land. So I think that would be a really interesting project uh, to engage on, to try and promote cultural history as a way of increasing environmental connection and concern. And since I was just mentioning indigenous peoples, I will say that um, it certainly seems to be the case that they, uh, they often have a, a very robust relationship with the local natural environment. Um, so they are very attuned to changes in that environment and they are um, perhaps more strongly affected also by changes in that environment. Uh, well, the next question is a bit of a challenge, a bit more, a bit more than making people uh, think about uh, plants having a personality and so on. Uh, Professor Glaucia Colley from uh, the Putenberg Institute wants to, to, to know how to promote the knowledge and importance of the preservation of microorganisms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say two things. One is I don't know the answer, but another thing is that um, we have to move beyond, and I'm sure that uh, Susanna and Alessandra have, have thought about this in terms of education. We can't assume that people will only learn about nature from their interactions with it because more and more people are living in cities and they are remote from, um, remote from nature in many ways. In the meantime, more and more people are spending more time with technology as we all are right, right at this minute. So we can't just say, oh, you shouldn't use technology, you should go outside. We have to acknowledge that people are going to use technology and maybe we can think about ways to use that technology to provide people access with a different level of knowledge about the environment. And I've certainly heard um, anecdotally people talk about becoming, falling in love with nature when they first looked through a microscope. Um, so you can get that different perspective on natural processes, perhaps with the benefit of, of, uh, of technology. And that's, there, there could be uh, video games out there that, um, somehow put you at a microscopic level and allow you to explore uh, biotic processes. I don't know. So it seems like there's potential there. Potential there. Yeah. Uh, I have also a question from uh, Professor Christiana Seixas from the University of Campinas. Uh, and she asked, what is the role of arts in changing behavior 
towards a more sustainable future? That's another great question. And I, I truly believe that we need every discipline to be um, involved in addressing these problems. I think the arts, um, and uh, I'm, I'm not an artist and I know very little about it, but I think one of the things that the arts can do very well is communicate um, and, uh, and they succeed in getting attention um, they can speak to people who might not be paying attention to other kinds of, uh, of communications. And they can provide a new perspective on something uh, to encourage people to think about it differently. And, and very often arts will have um, an emotional aspect that they, they create not just a, um, an understanding, but an emotional response to an issue. So I've seen some very creative attempts in museums to promote um, awareness of, uh, of climate change. Um, uh, I know there was one, I think it, somewhere in Scandinavia that flooded um, the building so that when you walked in, you actually had to step into the water to remind people of you know, the, the melting of, um, of glaciers. There have been very creative attempts to draw people's attention to species extinction through art. Um, so I think that uh, the goal of, of grabbing attention and communicating that there is a problem and encouraging people to, to think about the problem differently and to care about the problem, those are all things that, the, that arts can do. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. We we have another question here, but it's a question related to uh, the the way uh, projects are evaluated at FAPESP, so it's not uh, directed to you. Uh, before we finish this uh, event, this public part of the event, I would like to to make a, a tribute to uh, two. Uh, colleagues uh, from the Bioscience Institute at the University of São Paulo that uh, died uh, in the last uh, 10 days. Uh, and if you can find, I'll do this in Portuguese. Uh, eu queria aqui fazer um tributo uh, aos uh, professores uh, Sérgio Vanin, do Departamento de Zoologia uh, do Biosciências da USP, que eram os maiores entomólogos da região neotropical, especializado no grupo Coleóptera, foi meu professor eh, na graduação eh, quando eh, fiz ciências biológicas na USP, uma pessoa de um conhecimento enorme, eh, com um trabalho muito grande eh, pela comunidade também, foi editor de várias revistas e foi sempre um entusiasta eh, do, eh, do biota e da pesquisa que estava sendo desenvolvida. E o outro professor que faleceu foi o professor Renato Melo Silva, do Departamento de Botânica, também do Biosciências da USP. Renato era um especialista em campos silvestres, principalmente na família Velociácea, e, é, é, infelizmente, perdemos ele o, o amor e o entusiasmo dele pelos campos silvestres, que eu acho que ele perdoou de professores como o João Semir e a Ana Maria Juliette, é, realmente era algo é, espantoso. E, infelizmente, perdemos esses dois é, grandes profissionais que trabalhavam é, nessa área de diversidade. So, uh, sorry for that, uh, for talking Portuguese, but uh, uh, two colleagues, one that uh, was an entomologist, that was my uh, teacher when I did uh, graduated at the University of São Paulo. Uh, and the other one is a more uh, younger researcher that worked with uh, uh, botany and with some special families within the area of botany. Uh, so, uh, Susan, I would like to thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Susana, Alessandra, and Erica for organizing uh, this uh, uh, webinar. It was an enormous pleasure for us uh, to have first the idea of how much uh, the program, the Biota program has impacted 
this area of education and communication. And now finishing with this inspiring lecture uh, that you uh, gave us. Thank you very much. Uh, I will call the uh, remind the researchers that will participate in the uh, closed meeting to discuss the future of this area in the IOTA program, that uh, we will start the meeting in 15 minutes time, so at 11.15, and we meet all of you at that. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado a todos. Tenham um ótimo dia. Até logo.